Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where I share the human stories behind how technology is changing our world and work every day. And I was recently reading about a company called Candu, C-A-N-D-U, which is a product-led experience builder that helps any team improve their existing SaaS product without code. So ultimately, anyone can strategically embed UI components to create personalized in-product content experiences that can engage with their users throughout the customer lifecycle. And they've also raised $5 million in seed funding. But it was the story behind all of this that I want to hear and discuss today. And I also want to talk about the pros and cons of using no code for business development and the power of personalized user interfaces in your product adoption journey. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to the US where you can join me in conversation with Jonathan Anderson, co-founder and CEO of Candu. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Fantastic. I'm Jonathan Anderson, a co-founder of CanDo. Uh, we're a no-code UX tool so that we help basically marketers, product managers, all these folks who aren't normally involved in the, um, uh, directly involved in building software. We actually let them create uh, bits and pieces of web apps or websites. Uh, a little bit like um, improving a user experience without needing to always engage with um, engineering. Now, I always like to learn a little more about my guests. So how did you get here? What's your origin story? Where did your passion for tech come from or what lit the spot? Could, can you remember what it was that put you on this path? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I came through into tech, actually, I originally started in environmental science and then um actually jumped into tech because I wanted to find roles where I could, I could just do more faster. And there's really nothing quite like tech in terms of just reach and um, just the types of op- the opportunities that are available to you. I think as a young professional are like truly incredible. Um, I did find, however, that when I jumped into tech, that as a non-developer, I felt a little bit um, that I had the, <laughs> I had the, uh, I was off on the wrong foot in some cases. Um, and in part being kind of non-technical in a tech company, I think puts you at a little bit of a disadvantage sometimes when it comes to you know, increasing your scope. Um, and actually part of um, why uh, I took that can do was because I wanted to give those like technical uh, or non-technical techies a chance to really, you know, uh, drive really more meaningful outcomes at work. And of course, it was that path that led you to can do, which is this no code UI component builder. But can you tell me a little bit more about the kind of problems that you solve for businesses just for people listening that are hearing about you for the first time? Oh, yeah, of course. So uh, really the idea behind CanDo is letting these non-technical teams like marketing or product managers or people who work in customer success, uh, letting them build these like lightweight components or embeds that you use to kind of enhance a product-led experience. Um, so a good example could be like a welcome message inviting someone in or an onboarding checklist that helps them com- complete their initial you know, steps. Um, thinking about kind of applying a little bit of personalization and a little bit of honestly like just best practice you know, user research in terms of what drives behavior um, into like modern software products. Well, to this day, you love tech, but one of the things that stood out for me, especially around your story, is you still can't write a line of code. So you're in good company because I can't either. But <laughs> did that inspire you to build a no-code solution? And what advice would you offer to new founders that are in a similar position who have the ideas but cannot code and and almost let that hold them back? Yeah, I think it's a it's a little inaccurate to say I can't write a line of code. It's really? more accurate. I really, I really shouldn't. Honestly, like I just you know I can look at it and sort of interpret it and write something, yeah. but honestly, absolutely not. It should be the kind of thing where, um, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, like you really got to leave it up to the experts when it comes to building building product. So I think actually, as my first um, insight as a non technical co founder of a of a tech company, is you really need to find an amazing partner for yourself. Um, that's probably the first thing you need to do. Yeah. Um, someone you can trust on the tech side. Now, uh, for, first of all, I'm going to say I'm going to sack my researcher for for suggesting that you can't like <laughs> write a line of code. But uh, <laughs> what would you say are the pros and cons of using no code for business software development? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So I think traditionally, um, no code has really meant limiting things in a lot of ways. For example, you can only do a small set of actions, whereas kind of a coded example, you can do all kinds of things. You can do anything you want, right? Um, I think the, the really the way to think about it is like, is this a solved problem already? Or is this something net new, super unique to your organization that really only you can do? Um, and so when it comes to building, say, websites, in many cases, we've actually given over building a website over to, you know, a, a no code tool. There's some very popular ones out there, uh, like Squarespace or Webflow. Um, but when it comes to actually kind of building a web app, we're still very much in the world of like, let's just build it all with development. Um, and I think that's kind of like a, it's kind of a little bit too black or white in the reality of a lot of the world is that, you know, when it comes to building a software product, we have some really good best practices for how to onboard new users, how to get them to try new products, how to gamify the experience. Um, and so you can actually use a lot of these like pre-built or pre-solved problems kind of into the user experience itself. And that's really kind of how we think about it is, is what are the, um, what are the approaches that you can um, abstract and make um, you, you know, have worked in other places that you can kind of apply into your software application. Really, where does no code kind of fit into the existing product suite? And another reason I invited you on the podcast today was to talk about the power of personalized user interfaces, especially mm -hmm. around your your product uh, product adoption journey. Is that something you can expand on too? Oh yeah, I think uh, <laughs> you know, I think when you start building, especially enterprise software, it's yeah. very easy to get into the world of. Um, <laughs> you know, we need to check all these boxes for the procurement form, um, or we need to add, you know, a million configuration options for special client, you know, uh, A, B, or C. And pretty soon you kind of have like, the best way I can describe it is uh, the grandmother's garage of features where you have so many different uh, <laughs> options, all yeah. of which are in semi-useful states. Um, but humans are just really badly suited to that environment. Um, we are, we're just not multitaskers and we really can't uh, there, we just we have decision fatigue when it comes to too many things, and so a lot of what um, it, a lot of what we need when we first encounter, especially a new technology, is like how do we strip away all of this extraneous stuff so that we really only see kind of that initial feature or function uh, that helps us kind of complete our first job to be done. Um, and so a lot of what personalization is, is really just saying, you know, we have a million things that you could do, but maybe here's maybe here's one to three things that you really should do. Um, based on kind of where you are kind of in your life cycle. And so that's a lot of what we work on is how do we help, how do we help remove <laughs> a lot of the excess, very valuable features that just aren't valuable to me right now. And just to bring to life everything we're talking about today, do you have any use cases or client stories? You don't have to name any names that you, you could possibly share just to help listeners understand the kind of value that this tech could bring to their business or, or what it would look like in their world too? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think one thing that's really valuable um, is to think through kind of what is your customer journey. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, from the time that someone's like learning about your tool to actually maybe when, they've, when they're in onboarding to when they've actually like are a power user. I think that's one very common pathway people think about. Um, and then how do we kind of align the product experience to kind of match that? Um, we do a great job with this when it comes to, you know, um, how we think about sales and customer success. Um, and we do a lot of this actually through our email automations today. Uh, I would imagine that almost everyone listening has kind of thought through their, you know, what should the cadence of emails look like and how do you get someone to to learn about kind of the key things for them and then go down that path. Um, but I think where we're moving to as uh, consumers is that we kind of expect the product experience itself to really change based on kind of where we are in that journey. So I think a really, really helpful thing to think about is like, as a user first comes into your product, um, how do you welcome them, right? Um, how do we help identify what their core need is? Kind of like, what are you here to do first? Um, and then how do we give them really that basic set of steps to complete that initial job um, before they kind of get access to the full product? So it's almost like training wheels for your product, but what are maybe the set of screens or the set of you know UI experiences uh, that kind of are a little bit of a soft intro, a soft landing into what I'm sure is a super robust and powerful application that you have. Now, I recently read that Kando has raised $5 million in seed funding too. So can you offer a behind the scenes look just for any startup founders that might be listening around how you <laughs> raise money, acquired customers for Kando and all those things you may have learned along the, t along the years. I, I suspect it's not as easy as that, but is there any advice you would offer? Oh, I mean, I can certainly try. Um, yeah. First off, what a fun journey to go down. What a challenging journey to go down when it comes to yeah. raising money. Um, I think, so I think if I was in the shoes of someone looking to raise money from an idea, 
Um, I think the first kind of core thing to kind of consider is kind of, do I have the right team in place? Um, and by that, I mean, do I have the right set of folks around the table that can help me solve these problems? Um, do I have the industry expertise? Do I have the technical capabilities in the team? Um, is it realistic that I could pull together that group of people to really succeed at this, uh, really creating this, this opportunity, bringing it to life? Um, and then it really becomes, a lot of people think like, oh, let's raise money first and then let's get the team second, which makes a lot of sense. But when it comes to I think, lining up a seed investment, it's really helpful if the uh, person across the table from you can look you in the eye and say, okay, you're actually able to do this. Um, and I believe that you can do this. Um, and so actually that uh, figuring out almost the team is I think probably the most compelling um, part of, a, of any kind of seed story. Um, it's not really the product. It's not really your customer list. It's not really your vision. Those are all super important, but ultimately it comes down to like, do I think that the person across the table from me or over the Zoom chat um, is actually able to bring this opportunity to life? And although you're in the heart of this space, I suspect that you've also got your eye on uh, emerging trends, especially around things like product-led growth and no code. So I'm curious, is there anything you've got your eye on at the moment or anything that you're watching that, that particularly excites you about the future? Oh yeah, I think um, well, I think we're we're really lucky in that we're kind of um, at the forefront of these two trends. This, um, I think, no code. We're trying to kind of bring it to the forefront and move it into the world of um, you know really robust enterprise SaaS. But but there's so many companies that have kind of led the way for us uh, when it comes to building really incredible independent web apps like um, Retool and um, Bubble, um, as well as tools like Webflow. Um, so that's I think just a super exciting part of the market to be in right now. Um, and then I think on the um, enterprise SaaS side, I think uh, product-led sales and product-led growth have become kind of these like buzzwords that people feel like they need to be a part of because some of the absolute best uh, and most successful businesses um, are really do have a product-led model. But I think a lot of people who currently sell software or kind of or that's the the primary channel through sales are in this kind of a for lack of a better term. Uh, this elephant graveyard of ideas because they're they're not truly product led yet, right? They're kind of told that they need to be there, um, but a lot of the way that they actually make money is based on their um, is is really from the sales motion. And so I think a lot of us uh, in that space are thinking through, okay, what of these bits and pieces can we borrow um, without kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to the sales motion? And what are the um, what are some of the ways that we can become more product led? Um, given that we still probably use people um, to move the needle, right? What are the, what are the bits and pieces? I think that, I think that un, um, uncoupling that problem, um, what parts of the product led journey can I adopt in my organization is such an interesting problem because it's going to be so dependent on kind of, uh, your industry and also kind of where you're coming from today. Absolutely love that. And before I let you go, I always like to have fun, a little bit of fun with my guests. And I know you do travel from the UK to New York on a fairly regular basis. So that means you're going to have a big pair of noise cancelling earphones on you somewhere just to keep you semi-sane. So I'm going to ask you, is there a song that you could add to our Spotify playlist that inspires you or helps you get your head in the zone, especially if you're on that airline? Or is there a book you'd like to add to our Amazon wish list? All I ask is you give us um, a, a good story behind your choice. Is there anything that springs to mind? Um, I actually just recommended this. So I, I, to be honest, I actually don't read anything. Yeah. <laughs> I only listen to audiobooks <laughs> at this stage. Yeah. I haven't picked up a book in a long time, if I'm just being completely honest. Um, but one of my absolute favorite um, audiobooks is actually Americana. Um, it's this really beautiful um, book about a um, basically a writer, um, a culture writer who comes from um, Africa, uh, from Nigeria into the U.S. and kind of experiences what it feels like to be black in America, um, which traditionally her identity, of course, is being black in Nigeria, where it's the um, where her, she doesn't feel her race into a place where she absolutely does. And it is just one of the, uh, you know. First of all, it was just an eye-opening book for me as a white person. Yeah. And second of all, it just has the tone is just so inviting and interesting. And uh, I, it's really one of the best reads I've ever had. So highly, highly recommend. Well, as a fellow audiobook guy, especially on my travels, <laughs> I will be adding that to my list and uh, using one of my tokens on that one for sure. But before I let you go, for anyone listening just wants to find out more about CanDo, maybe contact your team, see some videos of it in action, etc. What's the best starting point? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, uh, you know, we uh, are very much a product-led company and we encourage people to explore the product. Uh, so please come check it out. Uh, can do, uh, like you can do it, uh, C-A-N-D-U uh, dot A-I. 
Um, and yeah, come check out these. There's, there's some really amazing companies who have built really interesting user experiences uh, that you can actually browse through right on the website um, and see if anything catches your eye. Well, thank you so much for sitting down and sharing your story with me today. I feel like we've covered so much in a short amount of time from the pros and cons of using no code for business software development, the power of personalized user interfaces in product adoption journey, and a behind the scenes look at how you raise money and acquired customers for can do all that washed out with your very personal uh, origin story there. And you even had time to leave us with a great book, but thank you so much for taking the time to share that with me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is such a pleasure. What a great guy. And what an amazing story, too. And I'll let you into a little secret. I was late to this recording today, and it was caused by a call overrunning. You know, when you try and get out of a call, and the longer it runs on, you can't. And I went in a panic mode. And by the time I got onto Jonathan's call, he'd gone, and he didn't think I was going to show up. But he was a complete gentleman about it. And we just arranged between us that we'd just hop on a call a little bit later the same day. And we recorded it with minimal drama and fuss. So he's an absolute gentleman. So thank you, Jonathan, for your patience today. And a little more digging on can do. And I think the best way to look at can do is a component like any other HTML component, except that it can be updated with a drag and drop editor. And that kind of flexibility enables other teams to make components or update copy without requiring engineering effort. So... But I think I should also point out that it's not a pop-up or guide tool. So Kandu's web components will not cover existing page elements or interrupt users as they use the product. But I'd love to know your thoughts on anything that we talked about today. Maybe you've tried it. Maybe you've tried something different. Maybe you've just got a different vantage point that you'd like to share. Whatever it is, please email me, techblogwriteroutlook.com, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn at Neil C. Hughes. And my website is techblogwriter.co.uk. But yes, you've guessed it. Once again, it's time to spin the wheel. Today, we talked about the power of personalized user interfaces in product adoption journey, collaboration software, no code solutions. But what is the topic going to be tomorrow, I hear you say? Well, you know the drill by now. You've got to join me to find out more. So thank you for listening as always. And until next time. Don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.